July 1969, Apollo 11 is go for launch. T minus 25 seconds and counting, we are go. GBF go. Bermuda. Guidance release 15. After a decade of work, NASA is less than four days from putting a man on the moon. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Liftoff. We have liftoff. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. But in 1961, when Kennedy pledged to put a man on the moon, NASA had little idea of how to get there. It was the most audacious thing NASA has ever attempted in its history. When America says it's going to do something, it does it. A new rocket was needed to rise to the challenge. But developing such a colossal machine would push science and engineering to its limits. These were people who weren't going to accept that failure was an option. What they achieved is little short of remarkable. It is still the most powerful rocket ever built. This film tells the incredible story of how NASA built the machine that flew man to the moon. We have you go for orbit here, go for orbit. November 1961, NASA pilots test the X-15 rocket plane. Speeding to Mach 6, NASA reaches out for the edge of space. 10, 12, 6, still good. Fantastic up here. But unbeknown to the American public, these rocketry milestones have been built on technology from an unlikely source. Nineteen forty. World War II rages as London burns under relentless aerial bombardment. But deep within Nazi Germany, Hitler's plans for a new long-range superweapon are being hatched. The V-2 rocket is the world's first ballistic missile and will leave Britain defenseless. But the V-2 has come at great cost to the Nazi war effort. However, these early lessons in rocketry will mark the surprising first steps towards manned spaceflight and the mastermind behind the V-2 rocket, scientist Werner von Braun, will later become an unlikely giant of the American space program. At the end of the war, US agents capture over 100 German scientists, including von Braun, and recruit them to develop weapons for the US Army. The story of von Braun's arrival in the States dates back much further than that. It was very clear that the Allies were winning the war. They had to decide who they should surrender to. They were too concerned about the treatment that they would get from the Russians. And that left the United States. Von Braun and his team were shipped over to the States in September 1945, along with 15 tons of paperwork and more than 100 V-2 rockets. On arrival in America, Von Braun continues to develop the V-2 rocket for the US Army, working on the rockets captured from Nazi Germany. Von Braun and his team were clearly interested in pushing the technology forwards, improving the performance of the V-2, refining some of the systems that controlled the flight. Eventually, they started flying two-stage rockets where the V-2 was the first stage and they had an additional booster as the second stage. With this small young missile called the WAC Corporal, fresh out of Pasadena, California, the V-2 WAC Corporal combination marked for the first time the blending in action of American and German rocket brains, a combination that was destined to have its rendezvous with history. As the Cold War gathers momentum, 
both superpowers realize the conflict will be won or lost on the power of technology. With missiles reaching higher and higher altitudes, it becomes clear that the ultimate symbol of superiority will be the conquest of space. The space race was essentially an arms race, but rather than using weapons of war, it was about the development of space technology. This battle between two competing superpowers, communism, capitalism, the United States and the Soviet Union, and what better stage could there be for you to convince the rest of the world that your system was superior than the stage of space exploration? Supremacy in space was vital. It said to the world, we have the technological superiority over our rivals. And this is why it came as such a shock to the United States when the Russians launched the first artificial satellite to orbit the Earth. All the people on this fast shrinking planet heard about it. Many of them watched it. All of them read about it. In 1957, the US learns of several spectacular Soviet space victories that send shockwaves across America. On October the 4th, 1957, the Soviet Union launches Sputnik 1, the world's first artificial satellite. Sputnik really put the United States into crisis. It was a global event. The Americans were absolutely shocked that a dictatorship suddenly beats them to the first hurdle, which was to put the first object into orbit around the Earth. Every day it was orbiting the Earth 16 times, and every day it was passing over American territory. There was nothing they could do about it, and that's why it had such a powerful effect on their psyche. On November 3rd, 1957, the Earth's second artificial satellite went into orbit. One month later, America suffers further humiliation as Sputnik 2 carries life into orbit. A dog named Laika. This hasn't got a primitive radio transmitter inside. This has got a living complex organism on board, Laika the dog. It was a massive leap in the eyes of the public and technologically as well. Desperation, the United States looked to the vanguard. Nearly 200 newsmen from all over the world were flown down for the big turkey shoot. And inside the blockhouse, the tension steadily mounted. had never been lower than at this moment, December 6, 1957. It's a terrible feeling when things don't go right, and it's also a terrible feeling when things don't go right for your colleagues. You feel dreadfully for other engineers. As people were basking in the awe over Sputnik, this was called Flopnik, because, of course, it got nowhere. It was at that point the American army with Werner von Braun were unleashed to launch a satellite within 60 days. And von Braun and his army team launched the first American satellite on the 31st of January, 1958. Power. Ignition, Lift off. In 1958, Washington forms a research organization to accelerate an American space program. NASA is born. Von Braun was enveloped within this expanding NASA organization that hoovered up all of those different departments of Air Force, Army and civilian activities to create the infrastructure that could mobilize major programs. 
Von Braun and his men immediately begin work on a heavy lift vehicle that they believe will give America the lead in the space race. Having stumbled at every hurdle in the race, there was further humiliation for the United States with the launch of Yuri Gagarin. He was the first human being to orbit the Earth, and that's all he did. One complete orbit, and then lands successfully. I say that's all he did, but we need to remember, of course, that every second he was traveling five miles. And he landed as a global hero. He was fated by the Soviet Union as a triumph of what was possible under a communist society. It really put a lot of pressure on the White House. How could you have let our country fall behind so badly? How could it be possible that the Russians could launch an artificial satellite and then secondly launch um, a human being? So the Americans felt this very, very deeply indeed. Kennedy said at the time, we're going to have to take more hits before we pull ahead. And that was the view, simply head down, focus, keep going. One month later, the United States responds with Project Mercury and launches astronaut Alan Shepard to become America's first man in space. To your attention, please. On low mark, T minus 15 minutes. T minus 15 minutes and counting. Status check, pressurization. Box tanking, you are go. Water systems, go. Range operations. Mercury capsule, go. All pre start dial lights are correct. The ready light is on. Eject Mercury umbilical. Oil evacuate. Mercury umbilical clear. Lights on. All recorders to fast. T minus eight seconds and counting engine start. Bolts and lift off. All right, uh, lift off and the clock has started. This is Freedom 7, reading you loud and clear. Control is smooth. What a beautiful view. Although Shepard's flight is a success, President Kennedy believes America must now show the world they can supersede all Soviet achievements. President Kennedy begins a tour of four space installations at Huntsville, Alabama, where he is greeted by Dr. Werner von Braun, space pioneer and director of this research and development center. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. And none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. Godspeed, John Glenn. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Kennedy's pledge will inspire the American people, calm hysteria, and unite an army of engineers to take up his challenge. But in 1963, NASA has little idea of how to build a rocket capable of flying beyond Earth orbit. Von Braun's favored design is a colossal rocket known as the Nova, capable of launching a large lunar lander this heavy spacecraft would fly directly to the moon to land on its surface before returning to Earth. When NASA was doing the very early designs for the whole Apollo mission, they developed a specification for a rocket which was never built called the Nova rocket, which would have been absolutely immense in size. The whole front end of which would have been a spacecraft weighing about 45 or 50 tonnes this would have been such a colossal spacecraft with such weight that people did not know even if the surface of the moon was sufficient to support the weight of such a colossal stage. The Nova design is eventually abandoned due to cost and complexity. NASA commit to an alternate design, a smaller launch vehicle comprised of three main stages. Consisting of fuel tanks and engines, each individual stage will burn at a specific time during launch. 
This stage design allows the heavy fuel tanks and engines to be discarded once used up, reducing the weight of the rocket as it climbs higher. This rocket will become an iconic symbol of the Apollo program, the mighty Saturn V. The Saturn V will send a small Apollo spacecraft to the moon. Unlike Nova, the Apollo spacecraft will be made of two modules, with only a lightweight lander descending to the moon's surface. This lander can then rendezvous with the main spacecraft and return to Earth. But before building the Saturn V, NASA must expand their understanding of multi-stage rockets. Work begins immediately on the Saturn I, a smaller test vehicle needed for trialing stage designs. Just five months after Kennedy's pledge, the first Saturn I is ready for launch. Over the next four years, NASA successfully launches a total of 10 Saturn I rockets, helping perfect the liquid fuel dynamics and multi-stage designs needed for the larger Saturn V. By 1963, construction on the mighty Saturn V has begun. With the most powerful engines ever built, capable of launching man beyond Earth orbit, the Saturn V will secure America's dominance in the space race. But building such a colossal vehicle will require precision engineering on an unprecedented scale. The Apollo lunar program was an absolutely enormous undertaking. At the height of the program, they had 375,000 people working on the project. The range of skills that were required was much, much broader than any single company could cover. The chance of success would be maximized by bringing together the very best minds from the top companies in the United States. Under the direction of Von Braun, Boeing, North American Aviation, Douglas Aircraft Company, and the leading computer giant IBM are all contracted to the Saturn project. A new launch sites control centers and vast support complexes are built across America. The first stage of the Saturn V consists of two main components, the fuel tanks and the giant F1 engines. The 42 meter high first stage will be the largest section of the Saturn V, with most of its mass being made up of rocket fuel. Two tanks will hold kerosene and liquid oxygen for five F1 engines. Many people forget about the fuel tanks, but you must remember the challenges. The coldest temperature on the Earth normally, it's about minus 88 centigrade in Antarctica. We have to go well below those temperatures for the fuel tanks to work efficiently. Oxygen has to be cooled down massively until it becomes a liquid to have the amounts of oxygen we need to get the Saturn V into orbit. So first of all, your fuel tanks have to function as some of the best cryogenic thermos flasks in the world. But you can't make them so heavy that you're never going to get it off the ground. So when you consider all of these challenges, it really was pushing science to its very limits. The five F1 engines will do the heavy lifting, pushing the 3,000 ton vehicle to over 8,000 kilometers per hour. When you think about the Saturn V, the mind boggles. But it wasn't going to go anywhere unless it had the right power plant. And this is where the F1 engine came in. Each of its engines could produce more than 620 tons of thrust. The F1 has actually been in development since 1955. But a cluster of five engines needed for the first stage will push current technology to its limits. But during testing, a discovery is made that threatens the entire Apollo mission. One of the biggest problems they faced was the issue of combustion instability. 
The individual motors burn three tons of fuel a second. Imagine three tons of fuel just disappearing every second. It's quite extraordinary. The flow of that amount of fuel into a cauldron of burning gas is a very complex physical process. The cause lies deep within the engine. Inconsistent fuel flow increases thrust, raising pressure and restricting the fuel supply, which in turn reduces thrust. The decreased pressure now causes a surge of fuel, again boosting the engine. The cycle continues with fatal consequences. They were actually getting a thrust flame which was streaking around the inside of the combustion chamber faster and faster and faster. This is leading to massive instabilities that engine after engine were failing after just a few seconds. And believe me, when an engine of the power of the F1 fails, it does so spectacularly and catastrophically. Thousands of engineers work tirelessly to solve the problem, eventually discovering that installing baffles to balance the fuel flow leads to a smoother, more stable burn. When I look back at the challenges that they faced, in a time when we didn't have computational fluid dynamics modeling on supercomputers, what they achieved in those few short years is little short of remarkable. These were people who weren't going to accept that failure was an option. They knew the time pressure, they felt there was a national goal, they were putting their hearts and souls into it, so when they encountered difficulties, and when we look at the F1 testing regime, boy were there difficulties. They didn't give up, they just learned from the lessons and they moved on. With the F1 stable, the first five engine cluster on a fully developed first stage is test fired. Collectively, the five engines now produce an astounding 7.5 million pounds of thrust, meeting Von Braun's original specifications. The four outer engines are then fitted on gimbals to direct their thrust for in-flight course corrections. It's the nearest thing you can see to an explosion that isn't quite an explosion. It's quite stupendous to see something that is so nearly out of control and yet being controlled so precisely. It's that balance that makes you respect the people who can design and build equipment like that. Although the F1 engines will only burn for two and a half minutes, they are a feat of engineering and to this day remain the most powerful single chamber liquid fueled rocket engines ever built. In parallel to the development of the first stage, work has begun on building the Apollo spacecraft that will fly the astronauts to the moon and back. But to flight test this Apollo hardware, a new rocket is needed. Construction of the Saturn 1B begins immediately. With a new, more powerful second stage, this vehicle will launch a manned Apollo spacecraft into orbit for flight testing. NASA selects 16 new astronauts for 10 pioneering manned missions, named Project Gemini. Gemini will develop the techniques critical to the future success of a lunar mission. With the space program gathering momentum, the American people share a new sense of optimism. But one day in 1963, everything changes. We have just received word that shots have been fired at the Kennedy Motorcade. We just talked with the police department here with that conversation. No one yet has any authoritative report on the nature of the wounds to the president. One policeman fell to the ground, pulled his pistol and screamed, get down. And a man across the street... It is now reported that Governor Connolly and the president perhaps have been wounded in this assassin's attempt. It is an unofficial report that both the president and Governor Connolly were wounded in this shooting event. Ladies and gentlemen, the president is dead.
at Parkland Hospital in Dallas. There at the time, you could feel it. A terrible sense of loss. It enshrined in the memory of all those who were there at the time in the United States, the fact that what Kennedy had begun was to ignite a dream, that a post-war world and that a young and far-sighted leadership could begin the process of transforming a world endangered by the threat of nuclear war, that essentially the American people could themselves be mobilized to make the world a better place. But instead of creating a demoralization, it brought a response of an absolute resolute determination that come what may, they would get Americans on the moon by the end of the decade. NASA defiantly presses on with Project Gemini. Clock started. Go on your way, Molly Brown. They make huge steps towards fulfilling Kennedy's dream and showing the world the America he believed in. Oh, man. This is the greatest experience. I feel like a million dollars. Gemini played an absolutely crucial role. Ten manned Gemini missions had to prove all of the technologies that were going to be essential if Project Apollo was going to meet its challenge of landing on the moon. Staring right down the old line. How do you get two spacecraft orbiting the Earth at five miles a second to rendezvous and achieve a docking? Uh, Roger, how do it look? It looks great. Would a human being be able to survive 14 days in what we call the microgravity environment? How does it feel for the United States to be the new record holder? At last, huh? Roger. Congratulations. Longer flight durations, docking maneuvers, and spacewalks are all practiced and perfected by the Gemini crews for the forthcoming Apollo program. Construction of the Saturn V's third stage is well underway at the Douglas Aircraft Company. Stage three has two main roles, requiring its single J2 engine to fire twice. The engine will first boost the spacecraft into Earth orbit and later reignite, setting the ship on course for the moon. But during J2 testing, engineers encounter another serious engine problem. The entire assembly exploded, destroying the motor and, and damaging the test stand very severely. The spherical tanks designed to pressurize the fuel system had ruptured, so a weld had failed, and the shrapnel created an enormous explosion that destroyed the motor and also seriously damaged the test stand. In subsequent investigations, it was found that the weld for that sphere was out of specification, and in combination with multiple tests of overpressuring the sphere, the assembly had weakened and led to that failure. Welding the fuel tanks of the Saturn V has proved to be a major challenge. Sophisticated modifications are made to equipment in order to produce the flawless welds needed to withstand the extreme in-flight stresses. All welds are inspected and subject to a new policy of over-testing to destruction. The big secret with the engineering on the Saturn V lay in the experience of the German rocket pioneers. It was the uncompromising commitment to test, test and retest. And the very systematic development of one system after another that were the core of why the Saturn program worked so well. Despite steady progress on the first and third stages, 
the second stage of the Saturn V at North American Aviation is proving more difficult. Due to redesigns of the Apollo spacecraft, the Saturn V is too heavy and the weight reduction must somehow come from the second stage. The original design of stage two uses two separate fuel tanks. But designing a single fuel tank with a common bulkhead separating the two liquids will shorten stage two and dramatically reduce its weight. But this leaves stage two engineers facing one of the greatest challenges of the entire build. Two intensely cold, highly flammable liquids will now be separated by only a thin layer of insulation. This common bulkhead was one of the really challenging, potentially show-stopping problems. A difference of nearly 130 degrees across those two cryogenic fluids. Hydrogen at minus 423, oxygen just the other side of this very thin wall, minus 297. You couldn't have heat leak between the two and the technology was stretched to the very limit in terms of the materials that were required for this common bulkhead. And all this was happening in parallel as these various stages were being developed. By May 1965, the shorter and lighter second stage is near completion. And in parallel, the instrument unit is also under construction. This circular section of the vehicle, 22 feet in diameter, will sit above the third stage. Manufactured by IBM, this collar holds all of Saturn V's flight guidance, detection systems, and flight control gyros. During motor burn, you've got to control the flow of fuel into the combustion chambers. You've got to control the direction in which the thrust is pointing. The engines are designed to move to steer the vehicle. Those engines have to keep moving just to keep it on track. So you needed the control computers that took signals from the various sensors, telling it how to gimbal the motors so that the thrust was pointing in the direction that was necessary. Of course, you've got to think back to the 1960s and what computers were like then. Probably your electric watch has got more computing capacity than this had. But as with many aspects of the Apollo program, the small steps to advance technology, to apply them in new areas, are all part of the story that leads up to, you know, laptops and, and you know, computers in our car and things like that. It accidentally threw off all of these benefits which society now feeds on. Meanwhile, the Lockheed Propulsion Company has designed and built the launch escape system. The Saturn V vehicle stood 110 meters. The final 10 meters attached to the top of the command module that the astronauts actually sat in was the launch escape tower. The launch escape tower was essentially to take the astronauts to a safe place in the event of a vehicle failure. The rocket motor would pull the command module containing the astronauts away from the rocket and it would divert them out towards the sea and the command module would come down into the water under its parachutes. With the astronauts out of harm's way, they can be recovered by the US Navy. Throughout 1966, Success follows success, and it seems nothing can stop the Apollo program. But in January 1967, disaster strikes. Astronauts Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee board a Saturn 1B for a routine static launch test. Once locked inside the capsule, a fire breaks out. In the pure oxygen environment, the fire flashes through the spacecraft, killing the trapped astronauts in seconds. The Apollo fire um, was a shock. The expectation was that we would have difficulties and problems. There was no realization that within the design of the spacecraft itself, 
lay deeply embedded serious engineering design flaws. And so the shock was a deeply incisive and damaging, to a great extent, impact on morale. Gus Grissom himself said, we expect to lose people in this business, and he said it must not stop if lives are lost. Sadly, he was one of those whose life was lost. But there was a sense that just as the death of Kennedy had deepened the resolve to fulfill his commitment, so too were the loss of these three lives not going to reduce in any way the effort and the determination and the resolution to press on and get on the moon by the end of the decade. The Apollo program is delayed while NASA engineers apply new fire safety measures. But with the end of the decade looming, NASA bypasses its reliable incremental testing strategy and proceeds with a high-risk all-up flight test. All stages of the vehicle are assembled at the Kennedy Space Center and the first Saturn V rocket will be launched as Apollo 4. We are go, 30 seconds and counting. After years of pioneering rocket design and engineering, NASA's first $135 million Saturn V is ready for liftoff. Okay, all flight controllers, let's play it cool. Final status check, booster. Go, retro, go, Fido, go, guide, Ten, go. Verify nine. your goal, Colon. Roger, we are go for start. launch. We have ignition. All engines are running. It was the most remarkable scene. It was the most impressive sight. The weight of a warship lifting vertically into the air. It was just breathtaking. Apollo 4 brings the dream of landing a man on the moon a huge step closer. But before astronauts can pilot the mighty Saturn V, further testing must take place. NASA launches Apollo 6, their second unmanned Saturn V, in April 1968. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have commenced. We have liftoff. Liftoff. Engine roll program started. Our vehicle going now to an azimuth heading of 72 degrees. All five F1 engines firing, uh, looking good. They're giving a green light at this time from range safety. NASA expects another perfect flight, but shortly after launch, the Saturn V starts shaking violently. If these vibrations continue, the vehicle will break itself apart. The vibration is known as pogo. NASA engineers have encountered POGO before, but never on this scale. POGO is essentially a vibration that occurs along with the rocket. It's created by the motion of the rocket, changing the way that fuel flows along the fuel lines, which then varies the thrust. And it can become so violent that it actually destroys the vehicle. As the first stage burn ends, the vibrations subside but the damage caused is about to become clear. Four minutes into the second stage burn, two of the J2 engines lose power and shut down. We have a report of a loss of engines two and three. With two engines out, NASA prepares for a mission abort, but the remaining engines gimbal to correct the trajectory and the rocket just reaches orbit. After this precarious flight, NASA investigates the pogo problem. Engineers discover the pogo vibrations ruptured a fuel line, causing the engines to fail. Apollo 6 flight data also reveals that astronauts would not have survived the violent vibrations had they been on board. 
NASA must stop POGO. At one point in time, NASA had about a thousand engineers working on the POGO problem. NASA decided that the POGO suppression systems that had been developed that hadn't been fitted because of the complexity and the cost and delays that they would have caused should then be fitted to all subsequent Saturn V's. Although engineers fit suppression measures to the first stage F1 engines, it will be several manned missions before they address the severe pogo of the second stage J2s. In October 1968, astronauts Isley, Shirar and Cunningham fly aboard a Saturn 1B on Apollo 7, the first manned mission of the program. Thrust is OK. Right on the old button. Roll. Roger. Roger. We have you go for orbit, sir. Go for orbit. They give the Apollo spacecraft a comprehensive system check out in orbit. Roger. Good morning to everyone in television land. Three, two, one, mark. Houston is go for the burn. We're burning the rates are good. It's a good burn. We go. Beautiful job. All hardware works perfectly, and the stage is set for further exploration. December 1968. NASA chases Kennedy's deadline with Apollo 8. Apollo 8 will be both the first manned flight of the Saturn V and the first time man will attempt to fly beyond Earth orbit to the moon. It was the most audacious thing NASA has ever attempted in its history. The challenge was not just to go to the moon, but to get back again. Apollo 8 was arguably the boldest decision that NASA has ever made in the history of human spaceflight. After years of design, development and testing, the Saturn V is handed over to the crew of Apollo 8. Astronauts Anders, Lovell and Borman. Our status board indicates that all aspects are ready, spacecraft ready, as we come up on the 62nd mark on a flight to the moon. T-minus 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. We have ignition sequence start. The engines are on. 4, 3, 2, 1. We have commit. We have liftoff. Clock starts, right? Roger, clock. Power power! Copy tower, Houston copies. Any big rocket launch is an assault on all your senses. It rattles the fillings in your teeth. I mean, it literally shakes you internally. The knowledge of where the vehicle was going and the hopes that were contained not just within the three people on board and not just within the thousands of people who worked on the program, but within the spirit of humanity that Project Apollo represented. Here we were, leaving Earth and breaking that bond with our home planet to place men within the gravitational grip of another world in space. My body was full of goose pimps. All right, you are go for TLI, all right? We're going for TLI. When that third stage was relit to head toward the moon, to see the velocity going up and up and up and up and up, the counters on the consoles, it was it was awesome. I think the Apollo 8 crew saw our home planet from a perspective that, that people have dreamt about for thousands of years. They were the first human beings to be able to blot out every aspect of human history, everyone they loved, everyone they dreamt about, all of their successes, all of their failures, just to blot it out with, with a thumb. It's the first time that the Earth was seen not as the place that we live, but as a planet floating in a black sky, seemingly insignificant among the, the vastness of the stars. Apollo 8 successfully orbits the moon 10 times, and on Christmas Eve 1968, makes a historic television broadcast to the world. For all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. 
and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. When I hear the reading of the passages from Genesis, it makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, and that's 40 years later. I think Apollo 8 is certainly a contender for the proudest moment of the Saturn V. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. Now with a fully functioning Saturn V, NASA accelerates towards a moon landing. In March 1969, Apollo 9 orbits the Earth for 10 days, conducting the first manned flight test of the lunar module. Three, two, one, retrofire. Mission confirmed. Two months later, Apollo 10 returns to the moon to practice landing procedures flying the lunar module just eight miles above the surface. We is down among us, Charlie. Roger, I hear you weaving your way up the freeway. It might sound corny, but the view is really out of this world. With all testing complete, the stage is now set to attempt a lunar landing. July 16, 1969, Apollo 11 astronauts Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins board their Saturn V. We are go. 20 seconds. Miles, go. GBM. GBM, go. 11, 10, 9. We have ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Lift up on Apollo 11. Four days later, Neil Armstrong sets foot on the moon, realizing Kennedy's dream and securing America's superiority in the space race. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. For the next six missions, the Saturn V maintains its 100% record. Between 1968 and 1972, 24 men fly to the moon and 12 walk upon its surface. This has got to be the most proud moment of my life, I guarantee you. As NASA grows in confidence, crews land in mountainous and valley terrain and explore vast areas of the moon in surface missions lasting up to three days. Boy, Houston, the beauty of this place is absolutely incredible. But on December 7th, 1972, man leaves the moon for the last time. What a ride. Apollo 17 closes a remarkable chapter in the history of spaceflight. In 1973, the final flight of the Saturn V launches America's first space station, and the service of this remarkable vehicle comes to a distinguished end. The legacy of the Saturn V is the number of scientists and engineers and teachers who were inspired by the sight of that magnificent, outrageous rocket standing on the launch pad. I'm one of that generation that are referred to as the children of Apollo. It drove my interest in, in science and maths for as long as I can remember. Saturn V was a totally remarkable vehicle. You just didn't question it. It was a pinnacle of engineering and a pinnacle of man's defiance of the laws of nature, almost. You know, I can do what I want, get out of the way. It is still the most powerful rocket ever launched from the surface of the Earth. Its whole purpose, the whole embodiment of what it represented, was to go in search of answers to questions that have been asked since the beginning of time. What we are, 
what is out there. What is that moon? What is it like to walk upon it? The Saturn V showed us that we could do it. It's about time we did it again. When people imagine the moon landings, I think you see an astronaut standing on the surface of the moon, and you also see that amazing rocket leaving the launch pad. This generation does not intend to founder in the backwash of the coming age of space. We mean to be a part of it. We mean to lead it. And I can feel the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Fire engines running. Launch commit. Launch commit. Lift off. We have lift off. We have lift off at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The tower has been cleared. But really, beyond all that, it stimulated dedicated workmen to shed tears when they saw that thing rise. The fulfillment and the culmination of their dreams carried forward into the cosmos by such an extraordinary vehicle. We'd like to give a special thanks to Mr. The Saturn V remains the most powerful vehicle ever built and will always be considered one of mankind's greatest technological achievements.